So welcome to the 76th Theoretical Physics Colloquium uh, by Professor Alejandro Ayala from uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico. He received his PhD from the University of Minnesota in 1995 at postdoctoral position at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and then joined uh, the Department of High Energy Physics at National Autonomous University of Mexico in 1997, where he remains since then. He, over the years, he received uh, numerous awards uh, that includes uh, becoming the member of the Mexico Academy of Sciences in 2002 and receiving the medal of the Division of Particle and Fields of the Mexico, Mexican Physical Society in 2019. He is uh, deeply involved in professional service. Uh, he served as the president of the Division of Particles and Fields of the Mexico Physical Society between 2008 and 10, and he is the chief editor of the Mexican Journal of Physics since 2017. His research interests include uh, particle physics, relativistic heavy ion collisions, physics of quark-gluon plasma, critical endpoint of QCD phase diagram, uh, quantum field theory in strong magnetic fields. And today he will be talking about plasma screening and the critical endpoint in the QCD phase diagram. And with that, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Igor, for this very warm introduction. And thank you everybody for being present. The uh, subject of the colloquium, as Igor mentioned, has to do with the properties of the um, uh, QCD phase diagram. And in particular, what I want to highlight is uh, what is the importance of plasma screening when considering what is the position of the critical endpoint in this uh, phase diagram. The following uh, Igor's instructions, what I did was to um, make a presentation which is uh, suited for uh, non necessarily specialists, they you know it works in a colloquium style. Uh, I hope that you don't find that this is. Um, um, at the beginning, at least too trivial of a, of, a, of a material. I promise that I'll go in crescendo to try to uh, make it more interesting for more specialists. But in any case, please, uh, whenever you wanna interrupt me, do so and uh, I'll try to clarify any point that may, may be raised. So the, this is the outline of, uh, of my talk. First, I'll start motivating the, the, the interesting research that has to do with the QCD phase diagram. And I'll mention uh, what is what we mean. In other words, if we want to construct the phase diagram, what we want to do is to draw lines that separate regions from uh, that have different properties. And these regions have to do with the breaking or restoration of symmetries. And in particular, I want to uh, stress that uh, the symmetries that are important, at least uh, for uh, the part of the phase diagram that may be accessible uh, in terms of experimental facilities are the chiral symmetry and the confinement uh, uh, transitions. And these can happen at finite uh, temperature and densities. When I say densities, I'm, I mean that uh, what we can vary uh, in, in, the, uh, in practice is uh, the uh, baryon density, but we could also imagine, and as a matter of fact, it, it is happening as we speak uh, in nature, that uh, we, may, we vary the, the isospin charge. So um, I will concentrate on the phase diagram in the temperature and baryon density uh, or chemical potential uh, plane. But uh, of course, this could be done in, in any other, uh, well, several other directions. For that, uh, what I need to do is to speak briefly about the nature of phase transitions. What is a phase transition? How we uh, define uh, uh, when we go from one phase to another? And for that, then uh, once we uh, talk about that, we will, of course, introduce the concept of uh, critical endpoint. And this experimentally, of course, has to do uh, with uh, what we call fluctuations. And we want to measure event by event fluctuations, several facilities, and I'll be uh, speaking about that. Uh, future facilities and actually uh, current facilities are looking for these kind of fluctuations to identify critical phenomena. So I'll concentrate on, on uh, that description a little bit to then go on, go on to, uh, with the subject uh, uh, with a more specific treatment of the subject uh, of the title of the talk, which has to do with how plasma screening is needed in order to distinguish the behavior of uh, uh, systems which are uh, perhaps uh, not non-interacting, um, a little bit boring systems, 
from systems where, um, which are closer to nature, which present uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon, which is called plasma screening at finite temperature and density. I'll do it specifically with a model which can be uh, worked out uh, uh, because it, it provides analytical results. This is the so-called linear sigma model with quarks. And then uh, once I do that, I'll uh, come to my summary. So once again, please uh, interrupt, the, interrupt me anytime you want. Um, so I'll, let me start with uh, uh, the phase diagram in the temperature and baryon chemical potential directions. Now, this is an artist conception and uh, the artist in this case is me. So it's not very artistic uh, the way I'm, I'm, I'm showing it, but nevertheless, uh, what I want to point out here is the different features of uh, what we want to look for uh, in the case of uh, QCD matter that is strongly interacting matter when we vary the temperature and the varying chemical potential. So first of all, notice that I've drawn uh, some um, uh, non-continuous line, which starts at some uh, temperature value in the vertical axis, and then continues to the right up until it uh, finishes in what I call a critical point. This part of the phase diagram, it's interesting on its own. As a matter of fact, it, we expect that uh, somehow the early universe and even current experiments at the highest energy have crossed this boundary in the sense that what there is uh, plenty of evidence that um, there is a state of matter qu called the quark gluon plasma, strongly interacting quark gluon plasma, if you wish, which uh, exhibits the properties of deconfined and chiral symmetric matter, uh, strongly interacting matter. Uh, when temperature is small and uh, densities are also not that high, baryon densities at least, we are in the confined or uh, chiral symmetry broken matter phase and uh, nuclear matter is an example of uh, such a situation. So in, under un ordinary circumstances on earth, that's uh, what we experience. Now, the fact that I am um, uh, um, saying that this is an artist conception about uh, what is the, the, this, this kind of phase diagram is because this uh, critical point, critical end point, is uh, actually not located yet experimentally, yeah, and there is expe speculation about its or existence or not. What, what is a critical endpoint? Well, a critical endpoint is basically a point where a phase transition of first order uh, happens. And uh, if it happens, then when it ends, uh, then we say that it's an end, end, end critical endpoint. Um, so the idea that uh, I want to pursue here is uh, how we can uh, try to pinpoint its position, and um, uh, we will do it with theoretical tools. And of course, we will try to do it also in terms of um, um, uh, experimental facilities in the future. To the right of this uh, diagram, there is another interesting uh, uh, um, kind of matter that can be uh, and that can be exist in nature. However, I'm not going to concentrate on that part. So for the time being, let me just ah, skip it. All right, so how do we explore uh, the, 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 the existence or not of this kind of matter? Well, we have two tools. The, the one that we have available in experimental uh, facilities on earth are heavy ion collisions. So the heaviest, the element, the more density we can achieve, or at that is the, the denser the systems are in the middle, at least in the, in the center of these uh, uh, nuclei. And so if we collide them, we have a chance to um, make the system even denser in energy or um, in uh, composition that is in, in, in abundance of matter. And uh, if that is the case, then we can try to explore this diagram. Now, how do we do it? Well, we need to vary the density. In order to vary the density, we need to use the stopping power of nuclei that collide. What, what is the stopping power? Well, if uh, the uh, energy put in the collision is not that high, then the stopping power is higher and therefore the baryon density or the chemical potential associated to this baryon density can become higher. This is the interest uh, on, on different uh, facilities and uh, what we are doing is now moving down in energy, coming down from the LHC energy realm to some other energies uh, and, and, and more, uh, well, from my point of view, uh, very exciting uh, times. Uh, Soon to enter into operation, there will be facilities like NICA uh, uh, with the MPD or uh, B, 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 EBM at N facilities that will be exploring this region. Another way of exploring it, uh, which has uh, recently become available, is the collision of uh, systems, uh, astrophysical systems. Something that looks like um, out of, an, of a dream is now possible because if uh, 
one is able to uh, distinguish what is the kind of uh, uh, gravitational waves produced by, by different uh, um, but by, by, by different phenomena in, in the universe, then uh, we can extract information about what is the uh, nature of the, of the content of the, of the objects that collide. So for instance, if we have two neutron stars that merge, the signature from their merging in gravitational waves is distinguishable from other signatures, such as, for instance, uh, a black hole interacting with, uh, with a neutron star or with a star or something like that. So if we, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, we can run simulations, and this is an example of a simulation in which we see that in uh, during a macroscopic, in the sense that it is more than phantos phantoscopic time, uh, the merging of the of two neutron stars uh, populates the phase diagram in the temperature and density plane. So this is a simulation for two different times. Uh, these are indicated here, and you see that uh, uh, with the with the lines that are indicated as well here, uh, we see that there is a possibility of populating this uh, this uh, phase diagram uh, as time goes on. So this is very exciting times, as I say, because uh, it's called the multi messenger era we can combine information from one and the other kind of uh, situations to try to uh, pinpoint what is the equation of state of this kind of matter in these conditions. Now, as I mentioned before, there is a, another possibility because uh, uh, ordinary systems are also uh, isospin imbalanced. Uh, a nucleus, especially a heavy nucleus is an example. There are more uh, neutrons and protons. So if we collide two such systems, then we have an, an isospin imbalance. And therefore, we could also study um, the, the, the phase diagram in these variables. This is interesting because, as I will mention, I don't have time to go into details, but as I'll mention, uh, lattice QCD can be a very interesting tool to explore uh, the behavior of matter under these conditions. Unfortunately, for the case of baryon chemical potential, uh, lattice QCD cannot do much. It can only bring us a little bit away from the temperature axis. However, in the case of the isospin density, it can provide the reliable uh, benchmark results. And this can be, of course, uh, uh, probed with uh, other theoretical tools in such a way that we uh, understand better these kind of systems. So it is, as I say, very exciting. And I hope that everybody is as excited as me. So let me get into why we can describe these kind of uh, systems uh, from the theoretical point of view. Well, as you know, the um, theory that um, uh, uh, describes strong interaction is QCD. And uh, here I write uh, with all of its glory, it's uh, Lagrangian. So of course the classical Lagrangian, uh, uh, QCD is a theory which has many, many uh, interesting uh, um, features, uh, especially when we go to the quantum uh, world. But uh, you can see here already that uh, uh, some of the characteristics, the main characteristics of QCD are highlighted because, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, in contrast, in contrast to um, electrodynamics, QCD is a nonlinear theory, and this is reflected on the fact that um, the uh, 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 part of the gluon uh, um, that, that involves the gluons contains these uh, terms, which uh, uh, become uh, uh, cubic and quartic if we, if we uh, work them out. So, uh, with this beautiful theory at hand, we can ask ourselves, well. Can we try to uh, extract some information and try to see whether or not we, if we put this uh, in a situation where the temperature is large and the bare density is large, uh, can we uh, uh, think that uh, there is a characteristic in QCD that make us um, uh, at least uh, foresee that something is going to happen when we heat up or uh, compress the system? And the answer is yes. Let me guide you uh, uh, to, to, to try to see why, why this can be the case. So to begin with, uh, remember that uh, QCD has this uh, uh, property, which is called spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking. Uh, if we imagine that the quarks present in the Lagrangian that I just flashed uh, are massless, then uh, we can uh, uh, realize that there is a symmetry, which is a chiral symmetry. It's the um, external product of two uh, SUNF groups, where NF is the number of flavors. And uh, this, uh, in the ordinary world, is broken because uh, the, the spectrum, I mean, we, we, we know that because the spectrum of hadrons uh, has certain features. And we know that instead of uh, living in a, in a binary uh, 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 vial uh, mode, we, we actually 
live in a, in a Nambu Goldstone mode in which uh, cattle symmetry is broken. This is uh, a, a signal by the presence of uh, almost pion, almost massless pions. And uh, in the real world, uh, uh, when this approximation is correct or at least uh, good enough, uh, we should speak about uh, three uh, flavors, which is which are light, uh, uh, U, D, and S. If we stretch a little bit um, the, 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 the symmetry. And if we have uh, only U and D as the massless quarks, then we have three pions, three Goldstone bosons. If we have S as well present in the game, then we have eight Goldstone bosons, which correspond to the lightest pseudoscalar. So, uh, cattle symmetry is broken in our world. The question is, can we restore it? And the answer is yes, if we increase the temperature and the density. But before that, or before going to discuss that, I also remind you that there is another important feature in QCD, which uh, is signaled by the fact that uh, there is a uh, alpha, the, 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 the coupling is not constant. It runs with the uh, energy involved in the process. And this is a beautiful example of how a theoretical description can uh, accommodate uh, many uh, experimental observations that as you can see, run uh, over a large scale in, in the momentum transfer involved in the, in the reaction. So alpha is not small, but it becomes smaller as the energy involved in the, in the, in the process increases. And it, it, it is, as I say, very well described uh, uh, by theoretical considerations and uh, it matches with the, with the experimental results. So what is the phenomenon behind this uh, running? Well, as you know, if we work at least uh, uh, at one loop, and uh, the argument here can be extended at more loops, but um, in the massless quark case, the way the uh, strong coupling runs can be uh, uh, summarized into this nice formula here, where mu tilde is the scale at which we are um, uh, uh, evaluating the ultraviolet uh, uh, component of the, of the theory. In other words, uh, the, the renormalization scale. And Q squared is the energy in the process. So if we know alpha S at certain reference value, just like this one, we can predict in this simpler scenario in which the quarks are massless, uh, we can predict uh, what is the behavior of alpha S with, dif with a different scale. And um, the behavior is controlled by this logarithm, of course, but also by this B1 coefficient, which is related to the beta function. And in QCD, under these circumstances, this beta function or this B1 coefficient is this difference. It involves the number of colors and the number of flavors with this particular combination. And as you can see, if there are 11 times the number of colors is larger than twice the number of flavors, then B1 as written here is positive. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the, the behavior of alpha S is such that for Q squared larger than, the, than, than this reference scale, which uh, makes this logarithm to be positive, then this denominator increases with, the, with energy and uh, therefore alpha S decreases. And this is the case for the, for the world we live in, where the number of colors is three, the number of flavors is six, therefore B1 is positive, and therefore what I mentioned. Uh, but see, there is an interesting uh, um, uh, aspect of this formula here. If the denominator uh, is uh, close to zero, then alpha S blows up. And therefore, the theory becomes very strongly interactive. That happens when Q squared is below the energy of the reference scale. And therefore, the logarithm becomes negative. The rest uh, keeps being, as, as I mentioned. And when that happens, then uh, we have to find what is the value of Q squared where such thing happens. And if I solve for this equation, I find out that there is uh, such value of Q squared, which uh, we call in, in, uh, in uh, QCD, lambda QCD, in this case, lambda QCD squared, which from solving this equation becomes this uh, formula right here. So uh, this, can, this quantity is, of course, renormalization normalization uh, scheme dependent, it depends on uh, what the scheme we use, but in the MS bar scheme, lambda QCD is of order 200 or 300 MeV. So this is quite interesting. There is an intrinsic scale in QCD, which is of order 200 to 300 MeVs, where something interesting happens. First of all, here it seems uh, that its, it's, uh, its first uh, uh, feature 
is that the uh, theory becomes very strongly interacting, uh, interactive, but and, and therefore that perturbative uh, consideration can uh, considerations cannot be uh, anymore uh, applied. But there is another aspect that you should keep in mind: the fact that this scale is a uh, an energy scale, a momentum scale, means that the theory has an intrinsic scale, it's non conformable in, in, in the mathematical sense, but it also gives us a boundary in which, if we add on top of uh, the vacuum some other considerations, such as the temperature or the density, then this is the reference scale. So anything that uh, involves an energy scale above or below or below lambda uh, will provide us a, a, a guide to see whether or not the properties of the theory change above or below such scale. So um, because of that, we can uh, think that if the temperature is larger or of order 200 MeVs, or if, for instance, we remember that uh, energy scales are inverse uh, equivalent to inverse uh, length scales, then the, for densities of order one Fermi uh, to the minus third, then something is going to happen. This is, uh, 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 at the end, on the basis of our search for the properties of the QCD phase diagram, because this is the expectation. If we heat up the system above this scale or compress the system above this scale, then something should happen. And this is why there, are, there is so much interest in, um, in, uh, 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 in present to build uh, certain facilities which allow us to explore these uh, ranges. I remind you, that the ordinary nuclear densities of order of uh, 0.16 inverse Fermi cube. And um, then uh, if we use uh, uh, these facilities at their correct energy uh, realm, then we can, of course, uh, expect that something will happen. So in nature, as I said, uh, this uh, is speculated that it's already happening in the, uh, in the, in the center of uh, compact stellar, uh, stellar objects, such as uh, the neutron stars uh, that we were discussing before. So you see that uh, in order to understand better what is happening, we need to do thermodynamics. And the, in this case, uh, uh, it's the thermodynamics of phase transition. So let me um, uh, change gears and to uh, try to uh, go quickly on what is the physics of, uh, of a phase transition. So uh, in, in ordinary terms, the phase transitions are just a change of a substance from one state uh, of matter to another. So the example is water, of course. At high temperatures, we have uh, vapor. At low temperatures, uh, we have ice. At uh, normal temperatures, uh, we have uh, water uh, in, in liquid state. And uh, uh, these uh, the changes of, state, uh, of the state of the same uh, substance can be controlled by external uh, uh, conditions, such as pressure and temperature. Um, when does it happen? Well, in, in uh, quantitative terms, what we need to do is to look for places in the phase diagram in these external variables, temperature and density, for instance, in this case, uh, for the case when the free energies, the relevant free energies coincide in both, both phases. This allows, allows us to uh, draw uh, transition lines, uh, speaking generally, of course, uh, this would not be necessarily transition lines, as I will mention uh, uh, a little after, uh, uh, we can also have continuous transitions where the, uh, uh, where, the, where the sharp transition doesn't happen. These are called uh, crossovers, but nevertheless, we can identify these, uh, these transitions or the crossover by a certain, uh, the value of a certain quantity on, on average. So um, the classification, uh, the name of first order, second order crossover comes from an old uh, classification due to Ehrenfest, as a matter of fact, and they are um, classified according to the derivative of lowest order, that becomes discontinuous in the transition. For instance, in the, in the first order transition, the first derivative of the free energy is discontinuous. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, we are talking about the density, for instance, if we, if we uh, uh, take a derivative with respect to the corresponding chemical potential. Uh, you, you may imagine that the way it, it happens is as, uh, as, as you see ordinary water boiling. Uh, there is the formation of uh, a, uh, a bubble, and the density inside the bubble is low. Outside, it's water density. There is a boundary, and there is a very sharp transition between the, the density inside and outside the bubble. Second order, for instance, uh, uh, the first derivative is continuous. However, the second 
derivative is continuous, and the, and the example is, as you know, the ferromagnetism, where the transition is continuous at the QE temperature. However, the second derivative, the susceptibility, is, is continuous just at, right, at, at, that, at that point, at that temperature. Um, so um, let's uh, try to put this in quantitative terms. Let's imagine that we can, can describe uh, a system, and in this case, let me think of a system of particles, which are just neutral uh, uh, scalar particles, just to make it uh, easier to, 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 get, to give the, the description, and uh, the, that, that they have a certain mass and zero. They are contained in a, in a box of volume B, uh, V, and we assume Boltzmann statistics. So the partition function is given by this uh, nice formula. It's, it's, it's rather simple. Uh, we have N of such particles, so we have this uh, quantity uh, raised to the power n. Of course, if they are indistinguishable, we need to divide by n factorial and sum over all of these particles. And this is nice because it allows us to, uh, to have uh, analytical results. So imagine that I want to compute not only the partition function, but the logarithm, which is the object that we use to get or to, ex to extract all of the information. And then you see that this logarithm is proportional to this Bessel function. It's very nicely analytical. If we take the limit in which the temperature is much larger than the mass of the particles, then this is the energy density. The only scale present in the theory is the temperature. So it's not surprising that it scales with t to the fourth. And the particle density scales like t to the cube. And of course, the average energy per particle is proportional to the temperature. This is nice. This is the so-called ideal gas for non-relativistic particles. So now imagine that we do the same, but in this case, we allow for, for particles to be relativistic to begin with. And then let's think that they are um, a system of particles which are not identical. They have not only different uh, masses uh, uh, signaled by this number, uh, this, this, this variable mj, but also that they are in a situation in which we have a temperature and a chemical potential. And uh, we may imagine that if we are in the situation in which we want to apply these considerations, so say for instance, to relativistic heavy ion collisions, then we, want, we could perhaps uh, uh, ask ourselves where or, or what values of T and mu, uh, the bearing chemical potential, uh, are such that uh, we could perhaps describe the abundances of this resonance gas that is formed after a heavy ion collision. In other words, when the, um, uh, even, even, even the, the elastic uh, uh, collisions when, when, when the system has hadronized keep happening, the abundances are already frozen out. So at freeze out, I'd like to know what the, are the abundances of particles and for that matter, I can use this hadron resonance gas model and find out what is the chemical freeze out temperature and the baryon, uh, chemical baryon, uh, freeze, uh, uh, freeze out uh, chemical baryon potential. So um, if I allow for the statistics, uh, that is a uh, uh, boson of fermions, I need to consider this plus minus one. And uh, the question is does this have anything to do with the transitions that I've been talking about? This is physics, which is completely different. This is an ideal gas of resonance, made out of resonances. The other considerations I was talking about uh, have to do with particular symmetries of QCD. Do they have to do anything one with each other? And this is what I, the first instance where I want to call your attention to uh, the subject of the talk. Collective phenomena seem to be playing an important role for this description that I'm telling you about to be successful. That is, uh, the, the reason is that multi-particle scattering rates fall off rapidly. And the experimentally determined chemical freeze out is a good measure of the phase transition temperature. Let me put this in, in real uh, words or, or, or in, in quantitative terms. You see that uh, here, what I'm showing you is uh, the result of several experiments, uh, STAR and ALICE. Uh, the red points are star, the, uh, the, the, this, this Alice point is it's, it's the only point. The, uh, the star experiment can uh, run over a larger set of values of uh, baryon chemical potential associated to this model that I'm telling you about, because uh, they can perform what they call the beam energy scan uh, program. So in other words, they change the energy in the collision when they change the energy, 
and they use the fact that the nuclei can stop each other for lowest energy, then they can do the excitation function, so uh, so-called excitation function. And for instance, if uh, they uh, run at top energy, 200 MeVs, they, they get the, the, lo the, the lowest variant density. But if the uh, energy is decreased, then they get the highest energy, uh, uh, the, the highest the variant uh, density. So now look at the position of these points and then look at this band. The band and the, say, for instance, this uh, line here are computed using this statistical model or lattice QCD. Lattice QCD is given uh, by, by this uh, formula here. Notice that uh, it is nice because uh, it's a line that um, uh, starts at certain temperature, uh, say this one here, this is the center of the band. And then it goes down very slowly because uh, the curvature is quite small. Now, Lattice QCD can do this because they can employ some uh, construction, which is basically a Taylor expansion. There, is, oh, there are other techniques, uh, for instance, the extrapolation from uh, real to imaginary chemical potential to explore close to the temperature axis. Of course, this is not easy, but it can be done. And the surprising thing that I want to, uh, you to call, uh, to, 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 uh, to call your attention about is the fact that the experimental data seem to be on top of this band. So how come uh, Lattice QCD has nothing to do with this ha uh, Hadron Resonance um, gas uh, uh, model, uh, but nevertheless, it seems that both uh, things are, 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 are uh, on top of each other. What is the physics? And again, what I want to call your attention to is that the, the, it is this uh, collective phenomena which seem to be playing uh, uh, an important role. Uh, so uh, I hope that I, I convince you that uh, there is a piece of information there in QCD, first of all, that allows us to know that there is a boundary uh, at different temperatures and different values of the chemical potential between different phases of the same kind of matter, uh, strongly interacting matter, but that this can be explored and this can be quantitatively described with these parameters, the chemical potential and the and the temperature at chemical freeze out. And that lattice QCD seems to uh, follow the trend that with this model, uh, experimental results are, are reported. But uh, we haven't yet uh, spoken about the physics of the critical endpoint. And the question that you may be asking yourself is, uh, is there such a thing? In other words, close to the uh, uh, temperature axis, there is this um, crossover, I didn't, uh, I, didn't I, I didn't make much emphasis about that, but this is a crossover. In other words, uh, the, the, the change from this phase down here for low temperatures to uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, matter that is formed at high temperatures is not sharp. It's continuous and it is signaled by the width of this band in QCD. The width is, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, given by the, the width of the um, susceptibility that lattice QCD can compute. So there is a crossover here and here in this plot, it is signaled by this uh, line here. However, there are some um, good reasons, particularly brought about by effective models that suggest that for high baryon densities, the phase transition is first order in the sense that I described before. So if that is the case and I lower the density, increase the temperature, and given the fact that this is a crossover, then there should be a point in which this first order phase transition stops. And this is the so-called critical end point. So is there such a thing? And this is what we want to look for. And particularly, we want to look for it from a theoretical point of view. But we also want to see whether or not experimentally we can access it and what is the energy where we can expect that this uh, uh, critical endpoint can be found. So let me just uh, again switch gears and uh, mention that we are uh, talking about critical phenomena. And the critical phenomena that we're talking about has to do with the properties of a system when it's, they are looked out uh, from, uh, from uh, um, say, uh, the, the, the point of view of uh, the correlation lengths. So uh, correlation lengths have to do with the, 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 the way that the, the system looks like when I um, uh, approach criticality and see, for instance, uh, when uh, we are below the critical temperature in a given system, and this system is uh, one, one uh, 
system which is uh, uh, experimentally uh, 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 available. This is a CO2. So below the, that critical temperature, uh, the correlation length uh, uh, or, or, or the domains that are uh, uh, shown by the correlation uh, length by, by, by this quantity uh, show this pattern. In, in other words, uh, they, they seem to be clusters, you see, that uh, are, are small uh, uh, in, in size. And in other words, they look like uh, the, the correlation length is uniform everywhere in the system. However, when we are arrived at the critical uh, uh, density, look at what happens. The uh, domains signaled by the different correlation lengths are varying like crazy. That is, there are domains, there are clusters of molecules in this case, which can have any size. This, of course, gives rise to what is called a, a critical phenomenon. And in particular, if we shine light on this uh, substance at this temperature, then we see that light scattered everywhere in all wavelengths. So this is what we would like to see in, in, in uh, experiments in, in, um, in, uh, when we collide heavy ions. And so we are looking for the equivalent to this kind of treatment. So what is the equivalent and how we can handle it? Well, uh, we can handle it in terms of what we call fluctuations. So um, fluctuations are, are sensitive to the properties, the thermal properties of the medium in a heavy ion collision, and in particular, look if we find fluctuations which are which deviate from the ideal gas situation that is we, when we have non-gaussian fluctuations in some conserved charges then uh, we can uh, uh, have experimental access to the position of the critical endpoint these uh, conserved charges of course we know are uh, related to, to to electric charge ordinary electric charge that is put in the collision or baryon number which is also conserved and therefore, if there are fluctuations there, we uh, have access to correlations. And of course, uh, correlations uh, means uh, uh, that we can perform deviations from the mean. And uh, in it, for instance, this is an example of one of the deviations. So what we see is that density fluctuations are associated to uh, uh, um, uh, changes in the, in the total overall charge that we are looking at. So fluctuations are closely related to correlation functions, and that's what we want to explore in heavy ion collisions. Uh, let me just uh, walk you through uh, the, 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 the main uh, argument. So imagine that we have a, a probability distribution function of a given stochastic variable. Let's make it in one dimension to, to, for simplicity. And so we can compute the moments, and the moments are just these integrals here. So we can define a moment generating function, which is this function here. And the moments can be easily computed by these derivatives uh, when we evaluate at, uh, at, at the value equal to zero of this parameter. So we can define as well uh, this, this, uh, this, this quantity, which is the, 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 uh, it, it related to the moment generating function. It's a cumulant uh, generating function by taking the logarithm of this uh, function uh, g. And then we can compute also fluctuations, uh, or, or that is, uh, um, uh, averages of, uh, uh, of, of a given moment, uh, but uh, uh, computed from this cumulant co correlation function, uh, sorry, generation function. So you see that you can compute uh, uh, this uh, 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 moment, uh, cumulant moment, by taking also derivatives. And uh, the first orders coincide with the ordinary uh, uh, cumulant, uh, with the calculation done with the ordinary uh, uh, generating function. However, when we go to higher moments, then you see that there are other uh, expressions that describe these, uh, these moments in the cumulant uh, language. So um, you see the relation with uh, thermodynamics comes through the partition function, which is of course the fundamental object and the equivalent in the description we, we are doing with the moment generating function and the cumulant generating function is because in the, in the thermodynamic language, when we compute z, we would be speaking about the, the moment generating function. But we, when, when we compute the logarithm of z, then we, we talk about the cumulant generating function. Now, interestingly enough, cum cumulants are extensive quantities. So if we have a number n of a conserved charge in a given volume in a grand canonical ensemble, of course, we can show that the cumulant of order n can be written as this object here, where x, uh, sorry, xi n are called the susceptibility. So these are extensive quantities because this is um, uh, proportional to the volume. And this is rather useful because if we want to probe experimentally 
what is, uh, uh, for instance, the behavior of a certain cumulant, we perhaps want to take away the volume effects, which is something very difficult to estimate in a heavy ion collision. You can, you can imagine, you, you collide a couple of nuclei, knowing exactly what is the volume, it's not easy. But if you take ratios of these cumulant functions, you get away, uh, I'm sorry, you get rid of the volume effect. And then by analyzing how these uh, ratios of cumulants behave, which is equivalent to the ratios of the susceptibilities, then we can extract information from the system. Uh, so um, cumulants uh, of higher than second order uh, vanish for a Gaussian probability distribution. And uh, when we have a deviation from uh, Gaussian uh, uh, behavior, then um, this, this is signaled by the fact that uh, there is a non-vanishing uh, uh, cumulant of high order. Two important cumulants of that high order are the skewness, we call it S, and the kurtosis, which we call it K, kappa. So um, what, is this, uh, what are these numbers? Well, actually, the, the, the uh, skewness is actually, as, as, as the name indicates, it tells you if uh, the distribution is inclined in one way or the other. And the kurtosis tells you it's not exactly a mathematical definition, but for our purposes, it will suffice. It tells you whether or not the, um, the, the, the distribution is wider than a normal distribution, let's say a Gaussian. So uh, the, the, what matters is the sign. It, if it's, uh, say, wider, it uh, has a kurtosis which is negative. And if it's uh, uh, peaked uh, sharply, more sharply than, uh, than a Gaussian, then the, the kurtosis is positive. So we are looking for these kind of features. Okay, so um, if we normalize the stochastic variable to the square root of the variance sigma, then the skewness and the kurtosis are given by the third and fourth order cumulants. And so we get rid of uh, 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 these, these effects uh, by, by just looking at these normalized uh, uh, moments. Now, as I said, this is the relation with uh, the, the thermodynamics, so the, 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 the susceptibilities, which uh, are proportional to the, to the um, uh, expectation value of, uh, of uh, 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 to some order uh, in, uh, using the, the, the cumulant generating function are related to uh, the thermodynamic uh, uh, quantity, which is just the logarithm of the, of the partition function. And uh, uh, this is the pressure. So, for instance, if we want to uh, compute certain susceptibility in the, in, in, in the numbers, conserved numbers, X and Y, then this is uh, the relationship. All right, so why did I make all of this uh, detour? The reason is because if we are looking for some behavior which is not ideal gas behavior, then it is interesting to see how these cumulants behave and these cumulants are related, straightforward related to what, I, what we defined as the probability distribution function. So if we are able to compute the probability distribution function as here, we can compute the cumulants and therefore we can ask whether or not this uh, distribution behaves differently from a normal distribution, which is here signaled by the red line. And so this is interesting. Uh, the object that we need to look for is this probability distribution function. Let me just give you examples of what uh, uh, we are, uh, people think uh, in, in lattice calculations of uh, how these uh, um, cumulants should uh, be, or ratios of, uh, of uh, uh, susceptibilities should be behaving. Uh, here in the logarithm scale, of course, uh, deviations from a Gaussian distribution should be something that is either flatter, uh, sorry, uh, wider or, or, or sharper than the, than, the, than, the, than the blue lines, uh, than the blue dots here. Anyway, so the way to explore for uh, this behavior is to do heavy ion collisions. And uh, what we can do, uh, it's, uh, well, I'm not saying it's a simple measure, it's actually very complicated, but uh, the simplest thing that we can uh, imagine is to do event by event fluctuations, measurement, sorry, event by event measurements of conserved quantities and look by its uh, to its fluctuations. So in a given event, we can observe a given number of particles, a given number of variance. A good proxy for the number of variance is uh, the number of protons. Then we measure in the next collision, what was that number? And then we can form this kind of distribution. So uh, 
uh, uh, measured uh, or, or referred to, uh, to the mean, you can see what is the fluctuations and then uh, we compute what is the number of events with a certain uh, number of uh, uh, protons uh, in the event. And then we can form these uh, functions here and then see whether or not uh, this deviates from the expectation of an ideal gas, right? So we do that. And if we look at uh, um, higher moments like kurtosis or skewness, as I was saying, particularly kurtosis, then uh, we will be more sensitive to these correlation lengths, which uh, uh, are expected to uh, be large. The, these fluctuations uh, are expected to be large in these kind of systems. And therefore, uh, we, we would be um, closer to finding out whether or not at a given energy we, we, we are exploring next to the position of the critical endpoint. Uh, so experimentally, this has been, of course, done. And uh, the uh, way this uh, is performed is by an energy scan for large uh, uh, enough uh, uh, energies, say REC, uh, we see that if we compute the net uh, proton product of kurtosis times sigma squared, then uh, at large uh, uh, energies, we see we want to see what is the value of this uh, normalized uh, kurtosis, so to speak. And uh, we find something. And uh, at high energies, we know that there shouldn't be any critical endpoint. So this is closely closer to what I was talking about, the, 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 the crossover transition line, and therefore uh, ideal gas uh, described physics. And therefore, this normalized uh, kurtosis should be close to, should be one, close to one. But as we decrease the energy of the collision, then something may be happening. And you see, for instance, for uh, peripheral collisions, 70 to 80% centrality, you see these black, uh, sorry, these white boxes here, which are consistent with one, but certain experimental results, and these are of course uh, uh, preliminary, uh, suggest that for central collisions, this excitation function does something different. It changes uh, from uh, to below uh, one and then starts increasing uh, above. If this was correct, then uh, it seems that uh, we would be close to finding at this collision energies, the critical endpoint. However, this is interesting. And although uh, this data is a bit controversial and you can see that there is large uh, uh, uncertainties, the, uh, as I will try to uh, convince you about, this is, is still not a signal of the presence of a critical endpoint. What do you need is as a matter of fact to explore down below here in this energy range. And what you need is a very, very sharp increase in this uh, uh, net proton uh, kurtosis times sigma squared. So it's not enough to see the change of sign, uh, oh, sorry, the change of behavior. What we need is actually a very, very sharp increase in this quantity. All right, so up to now, I'd like to uh, stop because I see that there is two questions in the chat. If you want to ask me something, perhaps this is a good time because what I'll do now is to again switch gears, try to put everything into perspective in terms of uh, an analytical model that contains the physics that can be used to try to understand this kind of uh, behavior for uh, the, 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 uh, the, this uh, generating, uh, uh, this moment generating functions. So let me stop here uh, and, and ask you, Igor, uh, do you want? to read the questions or to, or anybody have, uh, has a question? Um, I didn't see any uh, raised hands uh, actually uh, regarding the questions, but since you already stopped, I did have some sort of minor questions that I was keeping until the end. So uh, one of them is actually pretty simple and it's related to this very last uh, part of the talk. Um, while it's kind of clear that there could be this uh, third and fourth order uh, fluctuation uh, uh, skewness and kurtosis, what isn't clear to me is exactly uh, what exactly they are quantifying regarding the critical point. So I understand they could be, I don't understand what's the true physical meaning of them and the science, yes. if you wish. It's actually very, it's an interesting question. It so happens that when you have an ideal gas, then the distribution that describes an ideal gas has a particular name, uh, which now I actually don't remember. I'm, I'm sorry, I feel ashamed. But um, what, what happens is that your, your uh, 
probability distribution function is such that uh, you have like a Gaussian and uh, that's why uh, anything that, be, that that deviates from Gaussian starts telling you that something is happening, that you don't have the, the same behavior as you would be expecting for a non-interacting system. This is what it's called an ideal gas or what we have in mind when we say an ideal gas. So uh, because of that, if this probability distribution fun function is such that the width of the distribution or the shape that is, not the width, the shape of distribution does not coincide with the Gaussian. And I'll try to come up with, uh, with, with a more quantitative uh, answer, but you can imagine the probability distribution, if it, if it was a Gaussian in the variable X should be something like e to the minus X squared with normalized variables. Anything that is not X squared in the exponent is different from a Gaussian. Now, imagine that this X, your stochastic variable, is, as I'll try to convince you, an order parameter whose value tells you what phase you are in. And if that is the case and your stochastic variable uh, is, has some behavior other than x squared, in other words, the probability is not only e to the minus x squared, but it is e to the minus x squared, x squared minus something else, uh, x cubed minus something else, x to the fourth, then that, when that happens, starts signaling, signaling something which is different from ideal gas behavior. Is, is this making sense, uh, Igor? Well, um, I kind of see what you're saying that there is something where I'm trying to understand it. What is that something that it tells me? So for example, I know some model predictions tell me that this skewness could be uh, one sign or the other sign or uh, actually kurtosis. And frankly, it doesn't tell me much about the physics, what's happening in that interacting matter. Uh, I know it's interacting now, but I don't know what it tells me about that interaction. Absolutely. So uh, the, the short answer again is, if the system is non-interacting, then you are close to the temperature axis and therefore you can expect that the uh, Hadron Resonance Gas Model describes the physics of the phase transition in the way it does, as I showed you experimentally. In other words, the, the experimental results for the, for the statistical model coincide with the calculations of uh, lattice QCD, which have not yet found the critical endpoint. Now, if that is not the case, in other words, if there is a criticality present in the system, then there is no way that and that an ideal gas can describe the physics. And what, I'm, what we are trying to look experimentally and theoretically is what is the signature of uh, uh, departure from ideal gas behavior. And what I'm trying to tell you, and I'll, I'll show you explicitly, is that the deviation of ideal gas behavior is signaled by a probability distribution in the uh, order parameter which is different from a Gaussian distribution, which is the one that describes ideal gases. L give me a little chance and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be a, a bit more specific. Otherwise, in the, in the question uh, part, we can, I can try to address this again. Actually, there is another uh, raised hand. Uh, Klopot Yaroslav, yes. please, if you have a quick question, go ahead. Yaroslav, yes. You have to unmute yourself, perhaps? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, what about thermal equilibrium? Is it implied in your uh, consideration when you uh, calculate uh, the susceptibility or whatever? Right, yes. Thermal equilibrium is, is actually uh, uh, implied. But the, however, what we want to do is to try to describe, even in the thermal equilibrium uh, description, how you transit from one phase to the other. So what I'll try to argue is that if, for instance, we start looking for the critical endpoint, then we want to describe in equilibrium that this, uh, um, the energy of the system is such that there are two minima uh, uh, in, in at the phase transition. If there are two minima, then the system is confused. And then when uh, the temperature and the density change a little bit, the system will choose one of these minima, will cross the barrier, and therefore will go uh, into a discontinuous uh, 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 way into a first order phase transition. So yes, thermal equilibrium is, 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 uh, 
is uh, implied. Mm -hmm. But however, the uh, phase or phase transition will be signaled by, uh, by, by an effective potential. And I'll come to that uh, in, in quantitative terms, which tells me in what kind of uh, situation I am. I am in a, in a crossover transition or am I in, am I a, I in, a, in, a, in a first order phase transition situation? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so yeah, you could proceed perhaps. Um, I yes. uh, not rush you or anything, but it's about an hour mark. So just yeah, I'm about to 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 get to the to the to the um, final considerations, and then I'll summarize. If you uh, uh, be patient, I'll take no more than ten minutes. Okay, so how do I describe this? Well, you see, uh, we have. As I mentioned at the beginning, two important uh, symmetries or, 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 or features of, of QCD. One is chiral symmetry and the other one is uh, confinement. So now if you want to, to, to play with an effective model, you can incorporate both of them. There are uh, many attempts on, in that direction, but uh, let me just emphasize that uh, as far as we know, for low temperature, sorry, for low baryon chemical potentials, at least, the transition, uh, um, uh, the deconfinement transition and the chiral symmetry restoration transition coincide. So we can concentrate on a single aspect. And in this case, I'll concentrate only on one of them. Uh, um, and, and the aspect is uh, chiral symmetry restoration. And for that, I need to use a chiral Lagrangian and the Lagrangian I choose to work with is the uh, 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 linear sigma model Lagrangian, and this is here written in, in uh, all of its glory. And uh, it, you can see that it not, not only contains uh, mesons, but it also contains uh, uh, quarks. And these are these functions here. If I allow for spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is this uh, changing of, uh, of a minimum, then what I observe, and everybody knows uh, um, more or less how the, it happens, uh, this model that doesn't have any mass whatsoever, this is a mass parameter with the wrong sign, uh, the, the model de, uh, develops masses for the uh, mesons. Here they are, and um, uh, they, are, they are written in red. But notice, V is the order parameter. So uh, in vacuum, it is such that the pions, which are uh, these ones, are massless because the, the, the minimum is given uh, uh, in such a way that this number, sorry, this combination uh, uh, goes away. The, the sigma has mass. But this is in vacuum. So, but nevertheless, what we need to do is to treat V as an order parameter. What is its value when I change the temperature and the chemical potential? What is the minimum? And therefore, you can see that if we want to have a, a continuous description, something pops up uh, here in, in our minds. And what happens is that this combination could become zero or even negative. And if that's the case, then uh, usually what we think is that we have instabilities and we say, oh, well, this is nonsense. Let's throw away the model. Uh, let's not worry about it. And then uh, let's work with something else. Uh, let's do experiments, for instance. But no, that's not the case. And the reason is because if we want at first order only, then these instabilities will show up. But we need, we know what is the cure at finite temperature and density. And then uh, if we do that, then we need to go to the next order. And the next order is the uh, ring diagram contribution. And our ring diagram contribution is actually very interesting because uh, it provides you the first correction at finite temperature and density uh, after the first order, uh, sorry, after the, the, the one loop correction. So if we want to compute what we call the effective potential up to ring diagram contribution, then we need to uh, include the three level contribution, the boson one loop contribution, fermion one loop contribution, and the ring diamond contribution, which is the next uh, correction at finite temperature and density involves the self energy, which we can approximate at high temperature in this model. It can be computed analytically and you get this result. So notice something very interesting. What happens is that the self energy acts as if it was a mass a thermal and uh, a thermal mass, which depends on the baryon no, uh, the chemical potential and the temperature. And therefore, when that happens, you see that this contribution is equivalent to including uh, screening correction. So your plasma, your long wave length modes behave collect collectively in such a way that it, they resemble as having a mass. So it's a thermal mass, which depends on the baryon chemical potential and the temperature. And if you do that, it is not surprising that the mass of the bosons gets corrected. You see, instead of having this combination, which was uh, 
zero for the pion mass in, in vacuum or even negative, or this for the, for the sigma, the boson masses get corrected and they are, get corrected by the contribution of the self energy. So anything that could cause you instability, say for instance, imagine that this uh, self energy was zero, mb squared to the three halves is something which is complex, uh, imaginary. And because of that, this would signal instabilities, but no way. These can be cured by the presence of this quantity, which is term, uh, temperature and, and chemical potential uh, dependent. And therefore this quantity doesn't need to be, uh, in fact, it is not uh, imaginary. Uh, there is also another, and this of course happens for all of the boson modes. And uh, in fact, there is an extra co uh, contribution here because uh, it so happens that if you just stay at one loop level, this quantity here involves the mass of the mass squared of the of the bosons, and if they if it becomes negative again, uh, this mass squared, then then this logarithm again becomes uh, imaginary, and this is not what you want. At high temperature, it's easy to show that what happens is that you get a, 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 repla a replacement of such masses by the, the the ultraviolet scale, and this is very well behaved. You just have to, to choose appropriately what is the ultraviolet uh, scale. This is the fermion contribution, and this is also easy to compute at high temperature. It's analytical. And let me just go straight to the results. So if you do the analysis by finding the minimum of the effective potential that I've shown here, you see that um, uh, you, ha you have to choose the parameters. This uh, is a bit interesting to discuss, but I'm not, uh, I don't have time to go into that. But uh, if you choose the parameters which are appropriate for, uh, to describe the, the, the lattice QCD uh, transition line, then you can see that uh, for this range of baryon chemical potentials and, that, and these temperatures, you only find crossover transitions here signaled by our proxy, which is a second order. But it so happens that at some value of mu b and t, you find criticality, and this is signaled by a, uh, uh, the coincidence of uh, the, 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 the degeneracy of minima in defective potential for these particular values. And from here on, what you find is first order phase transitions. This is a nice description, and I can tell you what happens, what's the physics. If you remember the uh, probability distribution of our stochastic variable, in this case, the order parameter V in this description, uh, this, this uh, remember that the masses depend on V, here are the expressions. These are the masses depend on the order parameter. Uh, as a function of the order parameter, you see that this is the way the probability distribution that we spoke about behaves. This omega is the volume and this is the temperature. So uh, uh, again, if you do fluctuations, you will get rid of the, of, uh, in other words, uh, ratios of fluctuations, then you get, you'll get rid of this omega. So it doesn't really matter what it is. But notice, for zero chemical potential, bearing chemical potential and the temperature, uh, which we know corresponds to the uh, crossover phase transition in this situation, what you have is this behavior here, your potential is quartic. But as you increase the chemical potential, then something interesting happens. You see that this becomes wider, and then at the critical uh, point, uh, you get these sharp peaks. This uh, way of uh, representing the, the probability distribution is uh, chosen in such a way that it is a, an even um, a function of the, of the order parameter. Uh, this is also signaled by this uh, uh, behavior here. You can compute, for instance, the kurtosis. And as you approach the critical temperature and, and very chemical potential values, you get larger fluctuations in the kurtosis. And uh, now let's come to the, to the practical matters. Imagine that you know how to parameterize with uh, the uh, energy in the collision. You, can, you know how to parameterize what is the density and the temperature. And this is this red curve or this black curve, let me not go into details on how it is computed, but the numbers here, what they represent is the collision in the uh, center of mass system. In other words, it's the square root of S. And the largest baryon density can be achieved for energies, according to this model, this calculation, of which is uh, the Hadron resonant gas model, basically, uh, of energies of order of six uh, um, GeBs per nucleon pair. So, uh, this is the highest density, but the question is what in what energy here you have the right conditions to achieve the uh, critical endpoint. And the answer is here in our calculation based on this uh, linear sigma model. If we parameterize this curve here, right here, the red one, 
we show we can show that this is the parameterization. This is this is known in, in, in the reference that I'm providing here. And uh, look what happens. Uh, we compute the normalized kurtosis times sigma squared. And for large energies, large collision energies, we, we it, it behaves as we expect for hadron uh, uh, for hadron phenomenology, uh, hadron gas phenomenology. So, but notice that when we decrease the energy of the collision according to that formula, you get this dip, and then the critical endpoint position is signaled by the sharp rise of this curve at this particular energy. So, in this model, what we are saying is that we may find the critical endpoint, but at collision energies which are uh, small and even perhaps uh, outside the Nika energy range, but in the, uh, certainly in the Hades energy range, which correspond to about 200, two, 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 sorry, two, 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 two GBs per nucleon pair. Uh, so this is emphasized here and the deviation of the Hadron resonance gas uh, model behavior uh, can be analytically studied when we use the linear sigma model uh, with quarks up to the ring diagram contribution. And um, these ring diagrams are equivalent to include the uh, screening effects. So this is signaled by the divergence of this quantity. And it seems in, at least in this model, if, which is simple analytical, it has approximations of course, but it seems that uh, um, uh, everything seem, uh, is, is, is working out and it, it, it is consistent with this kind of uh, fluctuations analysis. So with this, uh, I, I, I really thank you for uh, uh, following me all the way to the end. And I hope that I can answer, fetch questions and answer them uh, uh, at your will. Muchas gracias, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for very detailed, informative and accessible talks. So I really appreciate that. So now we will have some questions, uh, some time for questions. So please raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, Konstantin Maslow, go ahead, you are number one. Hi, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, actually, um, well, uh, could you maybe delineate uh, what we would have in just the mean, mean field way of doing this? So, right. yes. That, that's a very good question. Mean field means that we just uh, include contributions up to one loop. But because of the problems with the squared masses of the bosons, mean field means that you don't consider the bosons as being true quantum fields. In such a way, the, these provide the mean field and what fluctuates are the fermions. And this is only the only thing that you need to consider, this right down here. This is not considered and uh, the bosons are just the mean field that, uh, that, the, that the quarks move in. And, and that's that's what it's called the mean field approximation. For that, all you have is uh, even powers in the effective potential, and therefore uh, something which is closer to ideal gas phenomenology. There is no way you can develop these cubic terms that I'm telling you that are developed. And I should have emphasized. I am now. I'm taking the opportunity from your question to emphasize that these give you cubic terms in the order parameter and therefore deviations from ideal gas behavior. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my next question would be about, uh, maybe can you tell us what the, uh, is the most important, let's say spectral feature of mesons or spectral regions, let's say, so in the medium, you can have this Landau damping contribution, let's say in meson propagation, yeah, or plasma contribution for quarks. Uh, is there any understanding of what of this spectral regions is uh, the most important for this uh, critical fluctuations? Right, right. Uh, let, let me emphasize that what matters is that there is never a negative boson mass squared. When you have, when you consider the plasma screening that is uh, low wavelength oscillations, then the masses get screened and therefore they never become, uh, uh, well, they, 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 they are never zero or negative, the, the, the square of these masses. And so this is what, uh, what, what it's called screening. Perhaps uh, what, what you're talking about is in terms of the spectral uh, function, what I'm telling you is that what you have is a quasi-particle mode and the quasi-particle mode has a thermal mass that prevents 
the ordinary um, three level masses to become negative, uh, the square of the masses to become negative. So I, I guess in, ter in the terms that you're putting it, that it, that'll be the answer. It's a quasi particle mode with non uh, 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 zero or negative square mass. Yeah, so uh, another part of it that uh, there is a region of spectral strength is a negative square root of S, let's say, yeah? So frequencies less than momenta, which people also, as I get it, include in hot thermal loop calculations. So uh, can it be related to what uh, what you present here? So, when you say when you say negative square root, what do you mean? Square root oh, of I mean uh, a kinematic region with uh, frequencies less than absolute value of momenta, uh, in which the spectral strength corresponds to absorption or emission of mesons by thermal bath. Right, right. That would be if you consider a scattering process. Remember that the effective potential are not scattering diagrams. These diagrams are bubbles just as I am trying to show here with the ring contribution. But if you don't do the ring contribution, you just consider this bubble here. So it's not a scattering diagram, Feynman diagram. It's a closed loop diagram. So in that sense, uh, this region is not uh, described by this kind of uh, diagrams. What you're talking about are scattering and is scattering diagrams and therefore Landau damping or something like that that you're talking about. Here, it's the full, uh, uh, a contribution of the of, of, of the of, of all of the excitations which are not necessarily uh, describing processes in which you are uh, scattering particles one one uh, against the other you see what i'm saying yeah i see that but i don't completely understand because in principle the meson contribution at least uh, well i can rewrite or try to re rewrite this in terms of uh, let's say uh, quark and tech work phase shifts and uh, somehow uh, scattering phase shifts. And uh, there uh, I will have a contribution from uh, such a kinematic region. So- uh, Yeah, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I agree with you that uh, any um, closed bubble can be converted into something that has external legs, that's true, by taking the proper derivatives. Uh, in other words, when you, when you want to cut certain uh, a closed line like this, you take derivatives with respect to something, the, the propagator, the, the, the field, uh, something like that, and then you can convert it. It's, it's actually a good point that you're raising. It is perhaps, uh, um, I mean, there, there should be some relation between scattering diagrams and this, uh, this, this closed loop diagrams. So I completely agree with you. I, I, off the top of my head, I cannot tell you what is the exact uh, relationship. Mm. Yeah, so I meant, uh, so I have a couple more questions, but please uh, go on with the next ones. So thank you. Let, let's see if there are there are some other people who may want to ask questions. And anybody in the audience uh, that wants to ask any additional questions? Actually, I, I did have one of the questions hanging since a little earlier in your talk. Well, uh, my general concern and maybe you have some sort of at least qualitative answer is about the size of the systems when you are changing the um, uh, energy when you scan over different energies basically you create uh, different types of matter perhaps more or less equilibrated and at some point i could imagine that the equilibration has no chance of happening so basically for sufficiently small energies maybe small systems so is there some rule of thumb at least, or maybe some qualitative arguments up to which point we can push it and still be kind of happy with, with the assumptions and where we probably shouldn't? It's, it's actually a very good point. It's an ongoing uh, um, um, building of the, of the general scheme, but as a rule of thumb, what happens is that the interaction rates which uh, happen are controlled by the temperature or the density. So if the interaction rates are larger than the expansion rates, then you are in good shape to assume that you will reach a, a thermal equilibrium. Now, you're absolutely right that the expansion rate diminishes when the energy goes down. So in other words, in an explosion at the highest, say, LHC energies, what you have is something that basically passes to each other and then it expands. And the rate of expansion is high. 
because you're putting a lot of energy in a, in a, in, in, in vacuum, basically, in, in, a, in a small uh, system. But when you have stopping, the, uh, what, what you need to un ask yourself is, this stopping produces this expansion and what, at what rate? Uh, as long as that rate is small compared to the energy associated either with temperature or with the, with the density in this case, you're good enough. But uh, quantitatively, it is going to, it's bound to be different. The, the stopping power is going to make that explosion is not this um, uh, um, uh, uh, high. Then in that sense, we can be better off because the density is going to be high. So that's the short answer. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, let me uh, pause for a moment and uh, use this opportunity to thank uh, Alejandra again for a nice presentation.